I've got another list here of the northern tribes and the southern tribes. I changed the font a little bit on the new ones, amen, make it a little bit exciting for you, praise God. But I thought that would help you as well, okay? All right, so those are for you up here in the front. And also we have uh, one of those uh, worksheets up here that we're dealing with right now in uh, 2 Kings chapter 13 and chapter 14. Okay. Okay, church, where are we tonight? Let's, let's ask some questions. Um, Heavenly Father, I pray for your help and grace and anointing about a minister of the word tonight. Open our hearts and ears to receive of thy word, oh God. Lord, we don't want just words. We want the word of God. We want heaven to open up. We want the spirit of God to touch every single one of us that we might learn, grow, and develop as a child of God. We thank you, Father, giving you all the honor and glory. We ask all this in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen and amen. I've got a little bit of adrenaline running over from the bus incident today, so hold on. Um, praise God. Amen. Uh, let me just say this. Remember now, what is Wednesday night? Wednesday night's a little bit different now. It's not prayer meeting, okay? Tuesday night's a prayer meeting, okay? And uh, Monday nights are women's Bible study. Thursday night's a men's Bible study. Sunday morning is Sunday morning. We have Sunday school. Wednesday, uh, Sunday night is Sunday night service. We preach the gospel, okay? And, uh, but, but Wednesdays is, is Word of Life Bible Institute. So it's, it's not, it's kind of like, sort of like, I try to make it kind of like Bible college, Bible school, okay? So we can learn. These are things I'm covering that most, most of the time, uh, pastors don't spend their time covering because people are not interested in this. But if you want to understand the politics, if you want to understand the timeline, if you understand what's going on and the setting in the book of 2 Kings, 1 Kings, and so forth, and these books we're going through, this is very, very important. They taught me this in Bible college, okay? And I'm going back and trying to refresh in my memory here, but we're going to come into something. Chapter 14 of 2 Kings, once we get into this, we're going to be really going into the, the setting here of the northern, uh, the northern kingdom of Israel being uh, attacked by the Assyrians and uh, being taken over by the Assyrians. Assyria, uh, you know, they took over, uh, Assyria took over over Syria, and, uh, and then they took over Israel, okay? And then the southern kingdom as well by the Babylonians. Very important because when you read Jeremiah, Isaiah, and you read the Minor Prophets, and you read 2 Kings, 1 Second Chronicles and stuff, you're going to kind of wonder what's going on. Well, that's what's going on, okay? Um, and so I hope to help you to get that. I hope to help you to retain that, and that's why I go over these things over and over and over. Uh, let's ask some questions from last week. Sin in the Old Testament was a big deal, but not so much today. True or False. Fall. Sin is sin. It is a big deal, right? Uh, what nation did God use to chastise Israel? Syria is correct. Uh, Israel's army was reduced to 50 horsemen, 10 chariots, and 10,000 foot soldiers. True or false? True. A very, very small army. They had nothing. They had nothing. Okay, no defense whatsoever after that. Israel left God to follow after false idols. True or false? In a desperate act, Jehoahaz sought the Lord for help. True or false? He did, yes. Um, Jehoahaz cried out to God, and he fully repented of his sins. No. no, he didn't, did he? He cried out to God, but he didn't fully repent. Israel rejected God's warning and shrugged their shoulders at him. Do you think Israel did that? Yes. yes, they did. How do we shrug shoulders at God today? How do we do that? Huh? By what? Not believing, by not, not believing the word of God, not obeying the word of God. We shrug our shoulders. We, you know, you know, as a kid, your parents might have got onto you, and you might have walked off and shrugged your shoulders like the attitude, right? That's that rebellious spirit inside of your heart. Well, the same thing with Israel. They had a rebellious spirit. They were stiff-necked people. You know, God said to his own children, they were stiff-necked people. We don't have stiff-necked people anymore. You know that? We don't have stiff-necked people. Oh, yes, we do. You know we do, right? Stiff-necked person is a, proud, a prideful person, proud, okay? Um, how about this? Israel, uh, judgment begins the house of God. True or false? True. The Bible warns us about the sin of unbelief. True. Is it possible for people to sit in church and yet refuse God's word? Yep. What causes our hearts to become hardened and refuse God's word? What does that? Disobedience, number one. Unbelief, yeah. The Bible warns us about what? The sin of what? Unbelief, right? Right? Amen? Um, okay, uh, if, we obey, if we obey God, we are blessed. If we disobey God, we're cursed. Do you think it's possible that the reason why some, sometimes things go wrong with people all the time is possibly because they're cursed, because of lack of obedience? Is that true? You think that, yeah, that's called chastisement. God chases those who he loves, doesn't he, right? Okay. People say, well, why does this always happen to me? Well, probably because you're disobedient in some areas. Could be God testing your faith, trying your faith, strengthening your faith, God speaking to you. There's all kinds of things it could be. It could be God trying to get your attention, God trying to bring you to a point of salvation, or God's, or you are saved and you're not being obedient to God, and so God's trying to straighten you up, okay? Trying to get your attention so he can speak to you, so you come back to being obedient to the Lord. That's how much he loves you, okay? Amen? Yep. Okay. <laughs> all right. Praise God. Where are you folks at tonight? After Jehoah has died, who reigned in his place? Yes, Jehoash, that's correct. That's right. Uh huh. Is this the same uh, Jehoash that was king of Judah? No. Okay, we'll talk about that tonight. Who was Jehoash's father? 
Jehoaz. That's right, Jehoaz. Just say Jehoaz, Jehoaz, whatever, okay? Hey, man, I got this little girl on my bus. She's new. She's from, uh, she's from uh, India, right? That took me a long time to figure her name out. It's Shosky, Shosky, Sosky. Sos- anyway, I can't say it right. I try and try and try. Sosky, Sosky, Sosky. You know, finally she laughs. <laughs> you know, she's like, no, no, no. I said, okay, forget it. I'm going to call you this. Sock it to me. <laughs> she likes that. So I go, I say, hey, how you doing? Sock it to me. Why she just bust out laughing. Amen. That's the best I can do, okay? Amen. Praise God. So we try to pronounce these names. They can be tough. Amen. Um, all right. Uh, jo- Jehoash, Jehoash served the Lord and destroyed all the idols of Israel. False is correct. How long did Jehoash reign as king? Correct. Jehoash had great respect for the prophet Elisha. True. Elisha had become sick and was dying of some illness. Does the Bible tell us what the illness was that Elisha had? No. Why did God not heal Elisha? Why? What? Yeah, just time to go home. Just time to go home. Hard for us to accept. Just time to go home. Okay? Okay. And so, so everybody that's saved, now think about all the people that passed away, the billions of people that passed away through the years, and all the people that are saved are in heaven right now, okay? Amen? Uh, it's appointed and demanded I once, and then a judgment. Yes. yes. Elisha wasn't healed. Uh, Elisha wasn't healed because he lacked faith. No, that's not true. Okay, just checking, okay? Elisha probably wasn't healed because he had sin in his life. No, okay. Elisha was a good prophet, but not as dedicated as he could be. No, he's dedicated. If the Lord tarries, we'll all eventually die of something. Okay. The greatest miracle is healing. No. Salvation. Salvation. There you go. That's right. That was the next one. The greatest miracle is the conversion of a soul. Okay? Praise God. All right, folks. Praise the Lord. Let's go to uh, 2 Kings chapter 13. Look at verse 10. 2 Kings 13, verse 10. Praise the Lord. And... Uh, 2 Kings 13 and 10, in the 37th year of Joash, king of Judah. So the Bible tells us this. Now, let me just explain some things to you. It's giving you the setting. It helps us to understand the timeline here and the period and what's going on. So remember Joash. Remember, he was the one that was spared from, from, uh, yeah, from Athaliah that was going to kill kill all of David's lineage, all the line of David. Remember that? Remember that? Uh, so, so he was the one that was spared. And so at seven years old, he was exalted to the throne, right? And so now he's, it's, now he's 37 years. Now he's 30, this is his 37th year to reign. So you take 37 and add seven, and, and that's how old he is. So he's 44 years old, okay? Uh, so you get the idea. Of Joash, king of Judah, Jehoash, the son of Jehoahaz, became king over Israel, that's the ten northern tribes, of Samaria, Samaria is the capital, and reigned 16 years, and did evil in the sight of the Lord. He did not depart from all the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. And you'll see that a lot in the Bible all through this, by the way. You'll see this a lot. Who made Israel sin, but walked in them. That means he lived in that sin. He carried on that sin, lived in that sin. Now the rest of the acts of Joash, all that he did, and his might, with which he fought against Amaziah, king of Judah. Now we'll talk about Amaziah in chapter 14 of 2 Kings. Uh, king of Judah, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the kings of Israel? So Joash rested with his father. So here he is, verse 14, he dies. Then Jeroboam sat on his throne, and jo- uh, Joash was buried in Samaria with the kings of, of Israel. Okay, let's, let's go on here. So, so 2 Kings chapter 13, verses 10 through 13, we see the brief record of Jehoash, or he's the son of Jehoahaz, okay, being crowned king over Israel. So Israel, now look at your map, the map I've given you, the 10 northern tribes, the list I've given you, the 10 northern tribes of Israel. The capital is Samaria. Remember that, the capital is Samaria, and the heart of Samaria is false worship, okay, idolatry. Now this is not the same Joash, that uh, king of Judah, they're different people, but the same name, okay, remember that. Jehoash Joash reigned after his father, and he also did evil in the sight of the Lord. You'll see this over and over and over, following the footsteps of their father. Let me tell you, bringing up children in the ways of the Lord are very, very, very important, okay? If you don't bring them up in the Lord, most likely they're not going to serve God, okay? So it's not good that he did this. Uh, here, here they go again. just seems that after some time, they would finally learn a lesson, but they don't learn that lesson. Here they go, right back into the gutters of sin again, right back into the sewer, just like a dog that returns to his vomit, and a, and a pig or a sow that returns to its mud, okay? Same thing. Here it goes again. Only they 
brief summary is given about Joash's reign, although he plays a significant part in the death of Elisha and in the reign of King Amaziah due to the war that he launched against Judah. We'll talk about that in chapter 14, a civil war. Jehoash reigned for a total of how many years? Help me, help me out. How many years? 16 years. We read that already, right there in that, those first few verses. He reigned 16 years. That's not very long, but that's how long he reigned. Just like his father, Jehoash, Joash failed the Lord and continued the sins of Jeroboam. Jeroboam, the son of what? Nabat, okay? Sadly, they say that because they don't want you to confuse this Jeroboam with another Jeroboam. So when you say that Jeroboam, the son of Nabat, that means that Jeroboam that instituted the golden calves, one in Dan and one in Bethel, okay? Right? A false worship and uh, idolatry. So sadly, again, uh, he became, uh, jo Joash became very entrenched in idolatry and false worship just as his father had. So he refused to turn away from any of his sins uh, of Jeroboam and he was steeped into idolatry, okay? It's in his heart, it's in his life. He returned, he refused to repent and turn to God. And although there was nothing positive really to report about Joash's reign, something significant took place while he sat on the throne. Elisha, the man of God, was dying. The king heard about the, the prophet's illness and he went to him. The Bible says this in verse 14, oh my father, my father, this is what Joash said, the chariot of Israel and their horsemen. We'll talk a little bit more about that later here tonight if we can get to it. This was the same way that Elisha had addressed Elijah, okay, when he was taken up in a fiery chariot from heaven. We know that story, praise God. It's really fantastic. Therefore, despite his flaws, King Joash had great respect for the aged old prophet Elisha. So even though, you know, Joash didn't serve God, but yet he had respect for the man of God, okay? So the king also recognized that Elisha was the, his uh, uh, divine lifeline, that is, of Israel, was receiving the help during the crisis with Syria. And so the king realized the only reason they got answered prayer, the only reason they got any help from God is because of this man of God. It's because of this prophet, okay? So the king said in uh, 2 Kings uh, 13 and 14, the Bible says this, Elijah had become sick with the, with the illness of which he would die. So, so as we touched on this last week, but let's touch on it again. So it's a very interesting passage because we know that Elisha had followed the ministry of Elijah. Remember that? Remember that Elisha was plowing with the plow, right? Remember that? And Elijah came and touched him with his mantle, right? He called him, right? The call of God, right in the middle of nowhere, amen, right in the middle of farming, probably all sweat and dirty and all that kind of thing. And God touches and taps him and calls him. So we know that Elisha was a great prophet of God. So we know this. He was called of God. He was anointed of God. And uh, God used them mightily. He did many, many miracles in the name of the Lord. And we went through. We already talked about all those miracles. In fact, um, where, where it is right here. In fact, you could probably go through this right here and find all the miracles that Elisha had done by the power of the Holy Spirit. He didn't do it in his own might. He didn't do it in his own strength. He did it by the power of the Spirit of God. How many know that if we want to see miracles, we've got to get back to relying on the power of the Holy Ghost? Church, you got to get back to believing God. We've got to get back to calling on God. Amen? We've got to back, get back to trusting the Lord. And what the Bible says, stand on the book, stand on the word, and start believing God for miracles. Start praying for God to touch, to move, and to heal, and to deliver, and to set free, and to fill. God will do it. God can do it. He, he, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So I'm going to keep preaching it, and I'm going to keep praying it, and I'm going to keep believing it, okay? Amen. All right? Praise God. All right, so here we got, here we have, uh, yet we see that uh, this man of God was dying of some kind of illness. Now, what kind of illness? We don't know because the Bible doesn't tell us. Was it heart disease? We don't know. Was it pneumonia? We don't know. Was it cancer? We don't know. We don't know. Okay, is that okay that we don't know? Yes, that's okay. In fact, I want to tell you this. If, if, if God wanted us to know, he'd have put it in the book. God didn't, want us to, God, God didn't want us to know or else he would have told us, okay? So why was he sick? Was it because the man of God had no faith? No. Uh, was, was it because uh, God was angry? No. Was there some kind of sin in his life? Absolutely not. Elisha is a man of God. Listen to me. He's a man that's full of faith, loyal, dedicated, consecrated, obedient, and trustworthy. He did great exploits for God. Isn't that wonderful? And, uh, and so he, he stood upon the word. He lived righteously. He was, but he was dying. Okay, so, so some believe that true servants of God never are affected by sickness. That's not true. That is a false teaching, okay? But truth be told, true servants of God, even mighty prophets such as, as Elisha, ultimately fall sick and they die. Now, let me just say this. Folks, listen to me. We'll all die of something, okay? Unless God comes, unless the rapture takes place, and I would like all of us to get out of here together with the rapture of the church. Amen. Be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. That's what I'm hungering for. That's what I'm looking for. That's what I'm praying for. That's what I'm desiring. But I just want to say this. If the Lord tarries, we all are going to die of something. God has healed me. Maybe God has healed you. God has touched me. God has touched you. Amen. So I'm just going to say this. Yes, I've been touched by God. I've been healed by God. Yes, that's true. But you know what? One day God's going to bring me home. All right? So we have to be okay with that. 
We have to understand that. Amen. Yea, though walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Now, there are two people in the Bible that have not seen death. Who is that? Amen. That's correct. Elijah and Enoch. Both names start with an E. If your name starts with an E, you've got a better chance of missing death. <laughs> I just thought I'd throw that in there to get a laugh out of you. Hey, man, you're paying attention. You know that's not true. But the fact is, they both start with an E, Enoch and Elijah. They didn't see death, okay? And uh, so they're, they're, they're thinking about that. They'll probably be the ones that are going to be the witness testifying against uh, Satan and the Antichrist and so forth and the end times, okay? But, uh, okay, so, so, so here we are. Uh, it comes down to this. It was just time for Elijah, Elisha to go home. God was calling him out. No doubt this is his final hour. And he would go through the greatest test of faith. But if God wanted Elisha to be healed, he certainly would have touched him. And he'd have healed him. He'd extended his years. Okay, he would have done that. But all Christians will one day be in heaven. We realize that. We'll all pass through the valley of shadow of death one day. All right? I was kind of looking at it today. I said, well, you know, if I, if I live to be 75 years old, I've got so many years left. Uh, 16 years left. If I live to be 80 years old, I've got longer than that. If I, I doubt I, I doubt I get to, I, if I get to 80, it'll be a miracle. I'll tell you that right now. Amen. But the fact is, you know, I've got so many. I said, Lord, I want to use these last years of my life for your glory. I want to preach this gospel. I want to win the lost. I want to see where the life double, triple in size. I want to I touch this city. I want to touch this area. I want to touch these kids with the gospel of Christ. Anybody want to join with me in the effort? Amen. Praise God. Join with me in the effort and believe God. We know that without a doubt that God still heals today. We see throughout the word of God where many were healed in the name of Jesus. Demons are cast out, still does it today. The lame can, are, are made to walk, God still does it. Deaf ears, ears are opened up, Blind, blinded eyes were made to see. The dead were raised to life. There's no doubt, praise God, that God heals. But everyone that was healed eventually died of something, okay? Therefore, as, as wonderful as it is, as I said, the greatest miracle isn't necessarily healing. The greatest miracle is when one, somebody gets saved. Amen. When somebody realizes they're a sinner, repents of their sins, and asks Jesus Christ to come into their heart and life and to be their Lord and Savior. And when you see that stick, amen, just like with Veronica, praise God, that excites me. Man, that's the, that's the greatest. You're a walking miracle. I want you to know that's the greatest miracle. Praise God. When you got saved, you gave your heart to God, justification by faith. You've been changed, amen, on the inside, transformed by the power of God. God raised you up, amen, praise the Lord. That's the greatest miracle, amen, amen, hallelujah. So we see the sovereignty of God with Elisha, okay? It was God's will for him to take him home. Now, as we mentioned before, that in, 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 uh, even in Elisha's sickness, the Bible says, then Joash, the king of Israel, came down to him and wept over his face. Now we see that in verse 14. It's amazing how the king of Israel knew the worth of Elisha, but wouldn't serve Elisha's God. He could have, but he didn't, okay? He's a free moral agent. He had a choice. The choice was he rejected God. How men love their sin. It's, it's unfortunate how men love their sin. I'm going to tell you something. America is wicked. We are very wicked. This nation is so wicked. It is so evil. It is so disgusting. It's so dark, demented, demonized. Man, it's incredible. Amen. Uh, our political leaders are evil and corrupt and wicked too. Most of them. I'd say 90, 90, 95% of them are. Oh, Lord, have mercy. That's right. Follow the money and you'll find it. I tell you, we have a very, 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 very quick, 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 crooked, wicked, evil. I'll let you figure it out. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. Very corrupt. Very corrupt. Okay. So, so here we go. Joash said, oh, my father, my father, the chariot of Israel and their horsemen. Now, by Joash saying this, he realizes a couple things. Number one. Okay, this is important. Number one. Do I have this written down, Brother John, by the way? He, thank you for having that enlarged somehow. Number one is this. Uh, the strength of Israel was never in the army. It was never in its army or its natural resources, okay? The strength of Israel is not in its army or its natural resources. But in reality, it was wrapped up in this frail prophet, okay? Likewise, likewise, and you can write that down. Just leave that there, Brother John. The strength of America or any other nation is a child of God that truly knows Jesus Christ as their Savior. I wish somebody would shout amen. Contrary to popular opinion, the strength of America is not in its bombs, it's not in guns. It's not in missiles. It's not in nuclear weapons. The strength of America is the blood-bought, born-again children of God. That's where it's at. Hallelujah. It's in those that stand for righteousness and declare the word of God to a lost and dying world. That's the strength Amen. of America or any other nation. The strength of America is because of those who will not bow in the face of adversity. It's because of those who stand upon the almighty word of God. 
The strength in America is because of those who live an uncompromised life for the glory of the Lord. Amen. Just like the three Hebrew men. Amen. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. All, everybody else bowed down when they heard the orchestra kick up. Got to bow down to the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar had made. But not these three guys. Amen. You can take their life if you want, but they're not going to compromise. They're not going to bow. That's the strength, amen, that we need today. Praise God. Let me tell you this. Let me tell you something. America is weakening because the church is weakening. I know a lot of people don't believe me in that, but the church is not what the church used to be. I want to get this church back to what the church should be, okay? What kind of church is that? New Testament church. Amen. Bible-believing church. Amen. The church that preached. Church of people under conviction. People got saved. People got healed. People got delivered. Demons cast out. People raised from the dead. Oh, glory to God. Why not? Praise the Lord. Let's be a strong church, strong in God, strong, oh, by the way, strong in the Lord and the what? Power of his might, amen. Get back to Bible, get back to God, get back to trusting him, get back to prayer, get back to crying out to God, get back to believing the Lord. Hey, how about this? How about separation, purity, holiness? Come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Be holy, for I am holy. What about that, okay? What am I watching? What am I seeing? What am I listening to? Is that holy? Is that holy? Is that holy? Is that of God? Oh, thank you. I'm, spo- I'm supposed to teach tonight, but I can feel the preaching coming out. I tell you that. I, hallelujah. How do you, how you not? Amen. Praise the Lord. I told my wife, I said, I like to teach in a Bible college. <laughs> I don't think there'd be much teaching. Amen. <laughs> oh, glory to God. Yeah, I don't think there's a Bible college to have me anyway. Oh, praise God. The only church that will have me is y'all. Amen. I feel sorry for you. The only church that will have me is you. <laughs> I love you guys. Amen. You know that people in Mary can't take this. You know that, but thank God that you can. Thank God that you can. Thank God that you know the truth. And listen to this. Listen to this. That truth, the Spirit of God bears witness of that truth, and it leaps in your heart. And you go, that's right, that's right, that's right. Preach it. Amen, amen, amen. Glory. Hallelujah. Spirit of God. Amen. Spirit of truth will lead you into all truth. Okay? So, so here we are. The strength of America is because of those who will not bow in the face of adversity. Let me tell you, America is weakening because the church is weakening. The strength of, its, of this great country is not money. The strength of this great country is not in the stock market. It's not in Dow Jones. It's not in the money market. It's not in NASDAQ. Let me tell you what it's in. It's in Jesus. Jesus. That's where it's at. Jesus. When this country was serving the Lord, when this country was a Christian nation, it had the blessing of God, the favor of God. God prospered this nation. God protected this nation. God was with this nation. God favored this nation. Not anymore. Not anymore. Not anymore. There are Christians in this nation, thank God. But we're, we're coming into a time where we're seeing a big movement of this. This is a big movement. They have a form of godliness, but deny the power thereof. They act like, they can, listen, they can say the same thing we're saying, but the definition of what they say is not the same definition of what we're saying. Okay? Same words. And people are making it very, very difficult, confusing, and technical. Technical. Ever so altering the definition of words, changing the words, and trying to defy the faith, and trying to question us, trying to cause us to question our faith, okay? Listen to me. I don't, I don't care. They can say what they want to say. Whatever. The unbeliever, the doubter, the skeptic, the, the ones that are walking away from the faith. I know this. I know what Jesus did in my life. I know he saved me. I know he washed my sins away. I know he transformed me. I know I'm justified by faith. I know I'm not the same person. I know I'm a new person in Christ. I'm a new creature in Christ Jesus. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are new. Everything is new. Jesus is my Savior. Jesus is my Lord. You can try to talk people out of it all you want, but you'll never talk me out of it. No, sir. No, ma'am. I don't care if I don't see another miracle, if I never see another person saved, if I never see God do another thing. I know that he's still God. He's still Lord. He's still sovereign. He's still in control. I don't have to have miracles to believe. Some people do. I've had miracles, but I don't have to have them to believe. Look at all the people that saw the miracles of Jesus in the New Testament. Man, it's like, oh, man, this guy, hey, make us bread. Man, this is cool. Multiply the fish and the loaves. Woo, oh, this is great. Oh, yeah. Jesus, I need you to do this. I want you to heal me. I want you to cast the demon out. I want you to da-da-da-da, all this kind of thing. Some people followed him, but there are a lot of people that walked away from him and followed him no more. Just the miracles in themselves did not cause the people or make them to believe. That is an issue of the heart. Either you believe or you don't. Either you're going to be faithful or you don't. Either you're committed or you're not. But if you're not committed, you might as well go live your life for the devil because that's the only life you're going to get. 
The only life you're going to get is this life on this earth. Go live for the devil. Go live for the world. Go live for Satan. The devil's glad you're not, they're not here. The devil's glad when you don't show up. The devil's glad when you're not faithful. Amen. He collects at his worship. God, the devil says, oh, hallelujah, I got another compromiser. Woo. Oh, yeah, form of godliness, but deny the power thereof. Mm hmm. True. True story. Okay. Hallelujah. Where are we at, folks? Where are you at? <laughs> Amen. How about this? Psalm 33 and 12. Well, I was praying for the God to help us tonight. Psalm 33 and 12. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. So, so, so if God is the Lord of that nation, if that nation, if that nation serves God in righteousness and holiness and believing God, then that nation is blessed and has God's favor, God has help, God has God's help, God has God's protection, has God's wisdom, has God's guidance, okay? The Lord is with them, okay? Look at Proverbs 14 and 34. Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Let me tell you something. This nation's in trouble now. We don't have the favor of God. We don't have the blessing of God. You might have it individually, but I'm going to tell you something. We all feel the effects of the sin of this nation with inflation, just like inflation went up back here. And uh, in 2 Kings, we talked about this the other day, last week I think it was, because of their sin, because of their wickedness, because of their evilness, guess what? Inflation went up, right? Uh, groceries cost more. In fact, inflation went up. Guess what? I had to put gas in my car yesterday you know what <laughs> that's right $41 $41 to put, hey man it wasn't like that under the previous administration It'd be like $25 okay I'm just gonna let you know okay so I'm just gonna tell you this we, uh, <laughs> just, read, just read my mind okay <laughs> Oh, Lord. Well, okay, so we feel the effects of sin. Okay, that doesn't mean you're in sin. You're not in sin, but you feel the effects of sin. We all feel it. We fill it with inflation. We fill it with the streets are not as safe as they used to be. Our children are not as safe as they used to be. They're, they're stealing and robbing children and uh, so forth and taking children and stealing them and, and using them for wrong purposes, okay? Evil, wicked, 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 demented. This comes from the pit of hell, pit of hell. This comes from Satan himself, okay? And the whole world lies in the sway of the wicked one. So we, we're not involved in the sin, but we feel the effects of it, okay? We can feel the oppression of the sin. I can tell. I can feel the oppression of sin over marrying. I can feel that religious spirit. I, I believe that uh, there are, evil, wicked, demonic spirits that are territorial. I don't want to scare you, nothing like that, but I believe some areas have uh, greater strongholds than some other areas, okay, whatever it might be, whatever, whatever it is, okay. So, oh, thank you, <laughs> whatever. Uh, but the fact is, okay, uh, uh, we feel the effects of sin. This nation feels the effect of sin. It's not like it was. I'm not saying it was perfect in the 30s and 40s and 50s. It was not, but I'm just saying now, it's a whole lot more evil now and wicked now than it was back then, and our children are suffering because of it today. As I was even talking to a parent today about children and what are we going to do about children these days? Our strength isn't in our military expertise. Our strength, thank God, is not in our government. It's not in our computers. It's not in our education, although I'm not opposed to education as long as it's the right kind. Our strength is not in our Social Security or our, prom our promises made by only by man to be broken. It's not in politicians because they are as corrupt as can be. They cannot be trusted. Our strength is in the Lord. Our strength is in God Almighty. Oh, hallelujah. That's where our strength is. That's where this church's strength is. That's where your strength is. That's who holds you together. That's what keeps you together. That's what gets you through the tough times. Amen. Yes. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Amen. You put money before God, you're in trouble. You put your job before, before God, you're in trouble, okay? You got to make sure that your relationship with the Lord is most important of all things. Making sure that you're, amen, you work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And it's in those godly men and women who will take a holy Bible like this and say, thus saith the Lord, will not bow. Amen. It's, it's in the righteousness of his people. It's in his holy prophets uh, who will not compromise their faith uh, or the message that God has given them. That's the strength of Israel and of the United States and any other nation. Okay? Praise God. Now, that was number one. <laughs> number two, number, <laughs> number two, it, it, here's number two. Another thought is this. Joash might have thought that Elisha was going to be translated like Elijah. And he thought, man, because they'd heard about this, you know? And so Joash might have thought that Elisha was going to be translated like uh, Elijah was. So how wonderful it is for one to live so close to God that even the unsaved as Joash would feel that translation was imminent. He's not a believer, but he's believing that it might happen to Elisha. 
So out of respect for Elisha, King Joaz paid him a visit. The prophet had stood faithfully for God during the days of this terrible apostasy. So we need more men and women like this. That, that's a, we're in a time of apostasy, my wife. We're in apostasy. People are falling away from God. People are drifting away from God. People are growing cold. People are, have lost their first love. People are coming complacent, lukewarm. Jesus said he's going to vomit you out of his mouth. If you're lukewarm, he's going to vomit. God's going to vomit you out, okay? So God, help us, oh God, I pray, not to be lukewarm, but on fire for the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? All right, so here we go. As soon as the, the king entered Elisha's room, he knew the prophet was at the point of death. Now, this is where we are here in the middle of the second Kings, okay? Joash, weeping, finally acknowledged that Elisha had been Israel's true defense against the enemies of God. It was because of Elisha. The nation's true defense and protections were in the prayers of Elisha and in the Lord who answered his prayers. And so, and so then the king's going, man, if we don't have Elisha, we don't have this prophet of God. We're not going to have God's favor. We're not going to have God's help. We're doomed. If, we, if this prophet dies, we're dead. That's what he's thinking, Okay. But although Joaz had expressed some faith in the Lord, okay, Elisha sought to arouse a complete faith within the kings. If he could stimulate a complete faith within Joash, then the king, could la- the king could launch a reform throughout the nation. Revival could take place. Hopefully, this would turn the people back to God. That's what Elisha's hoping for, okay? Therefore, while lying on his deathbed, Elisha gave the king one last prediction and promise. It was a symbolic picture of Israel's coming victory over Syria. Now, here we have Syria. Remember, Benadad, the king of Syria, okay? Uh, and and, and uh, Benadad uh, and uh, his son and so forth. Remember this, okay? So, um, uh, hallelujah. I lost my train of thought on that. Hold on a second. I want to check something out real quick here. Um, I know I got probably in one of these pages, right? Hallelujah. <laughs> praise, praise the Lord. Yeah, okay, King Haziel, he's the king of Syria. Benadab was his son. I just want to make, I get those two backwards sometimes. So you'll, you'll hear about King Haziel. He's the king of Syria presently. And then and you got Benadad. Benadad is the son that takes over eventually, okay? Okay, so, so here we got, here we have this setting here. Give me a few more minutes, okay? And, uh, and so, and so while, while lying on his deathbed, Elisha gave the king one last prediction, a promise. It's a symbolic picture of Israel's coming victory over the Syrians. Okay, so, so Elisha instructed the king to take a bow along with some arrows in his hand. And Elisha then placed his hand on the king's hand. Then Elisha told him to open up the window that's facing the east. Open up the east window. There you are right there. And he said, shoot the arrow out that window as far as you can, okay? And so what a beautiful picture it must have been for the ancient knurled hands of the aged prophet Elisha to be placed on the hands of the king of Israel. What a beautiful picture there, okay? He places his hands upon the king's hand to make it very clear that the victory would be entirely because of God's grace. It's not because of you, king. It's not because you deserve it. You don't deserve salvation. You don't deserve deliverance. It's only by the grace of God. And I want to make that very clear to you, king. It's not because of you. Yeah, okay? Your salvation is not because of you. It's because of God's grace in, his, in your life. Amen? Okay? And also, it would be an absolute, it would be for certain, okay? So he's making this. So when the king shot the arrows, or out the east window, the prophet shouted out that the arrow symbolized the Lord's victory over Syria. The Lord's victory over Syria. Israel would defeat the Syrians at, at the Battle of Apec, okay? And, uh, and, and they would have total victory, okay? And uh, so 2 Kings 13, now here we are in verse 17, 18. Here we go, ready? 17 and 18, it says, Then Elisha said, shoot, and he shot. And he said, the arrows of the Lord deliverance and the arrow of deliverance from Syria, for you must strike the Syrians at Apex till you have destroyed them. Then he said, take the arrows. So he took them. Then Elisha told the king to take the arrows and strike the ground. And so then the Bible says that the king struck three times and stopped. You see that in verse 18. So he shot the arrow out the east window, and then he took the arrows that he had in his hand, and he hit the ground three times. Oh, I don't know why he does that. Hold on. Somebody's hitting me with their arrows. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Okay. So Elisha, whew, I don't know why. I got to get a new, uh, a new uh, one of these things. Elisha became angry with him because he should have struck the ground five or six times. He said, you should have struck it five or six times. But because he only struck the ground three times, Israel will only defeat the Syrians three times. Okay. What does that mean? They would not completely destroy their enemy. That's what it means. Okay. So in other words, this, they would not have total victory. They would not have total victory. They could have had it. But they won't have it. How often, let me ask you this, how often does the Christian, the believer, stop short of having total and complete victory over their enemies? How often? They stop short. How many times do we, we stop short in prayer? We stop short in worship. We stop w- short in a word. We stop short in believing for more. 
Folks, listen to me. We could have victory if we would not stop short. Amen. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes. Oh, yes, they do. And, and Israel said this. When this all, and when this first happened with Israel, just, you know, this, this last event, okay? They said, listen, we're used to it. We know this. The world will turn against us. They're with us right now because they feel sorry for us. But after a little while, we're used to this. They're going to turn against us. And you know what? They're right. They're right. I'm sorry, but sometimes the enemy has to be annihilated. Okay? You're not going to change them. Okay? Unfortunately, you're not going to change them. Some, you just have to take them. Some people have to be restrained. Okay? My son's a police officer. Why? Because some people have to be restrained. Okay? They're going to hurt themselves or they're going to hurt somebody else. Right? Isn't that right? So, oh, Lord have mercy. What's that? What's that young girl that was beat up by a mob of other girls, beat their, her head on the ground? This just happened. Beat her head on the ground, put her in a coma. She's fighting for her life. She's in, uh, uh, not here in Marion. I don't know what state it's in. It's in America. And uh, so you chat, what, what's going on today? You've got these gangs, that, uh, gangs of kids, students after school, whatever, before school, and they, they find someone that's by themselves, and they jump out and gang up on them, act like everything's cool, and then they, they turn against them, and they, they fight them and beat them up, banged her head on the concrete, boom, 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 caused her brain to swell, and now she's in a coma fighting for her life. We don't know if she's going to pull through. Isn't that sad? This is what's going on today. Okay, this is a result of sin, result of wickedness, okay? All right, this all started in the very beginning, all right? Adam and Eve ate the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God told not to. And so the first murder was born for any gun, any bullet, any rifle, any, any shotgun, any pistol. Who was it? It was Cain killing his brother, his own family member, his brother, Abel, his own blood, his own kin, his own brother. Killed him with a stick or a stone or whatever. You know, killed him with something, all right? They have to. If they, if, if they let Hamas live, it's going to happen again. It'll happen again. It'll happen again. I promise you it'll happen again. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. But see, there's a certain administration probably wants to be like the good guy and act like, you know, he solved the problem. He can't solve it. He can't make his way out of a paper bag. He couldn't, he, couldn't, he, couldn't, he couldn't manage Walmart. You know that. You know that. I'm sorry, he couldn't. I'm sorry. It's the truth. It's truth. I'm sorry. Listen, the poor guy, he's being used. He's being used. He's a puppet. Yeah. Oh, Lord, have mercy. God, have mercy. Yeah. Okay, let's move on. <laughs> you guys are killing me. Listen to me. I'm going to say this. We vote. I don't care who's running office. You have to vote convictions that are according to the Bible. Murder is murder. It's not women's health. It's murder, okay? We don't murder children. We don't murder babies. We don't murder people, okay? So we have to understand that our convictions have to be based on the Bible. Our convictions are based on the Word of God, yeah. all right? So if somebody's running for office, and, I, and they share the same convictions I have according to the Word of God, I'm going to vote for them, okay? Yeah. I might not like their personality. I might not like their speeches. I might not like the way they talk. I might not like the fact they might be arrogant. Okay, I understand that, but who in Washington is not arrogant, okay? Let me just say this. I'm going to just say this. I vote based on the convictions, based on the Bible, okay? Yeah. I am for life. You can't be a Christian and vote for murder. You can't be a Christian and say it's okay to kill babies in the womb, okay? Now, I'm just saying that. Those are convictions that we have. We had to hold to the Word of God. Ultimately, when you lay your head down at night in bed, you have to answer to God, okay? You have to have a clean, clear conscience. I want to have a peace in my heart and a clear conscience, okay? All right. I, I said all that because Brother Jim wanted me to tonight, I guarantee you. <laughs> uh, Praise God. Okay, so, 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 so here he is. He, so, so in other words, uh, um, a lot of times, you know, uh, because he only struck the ground three times, <clears throat> defeat uh, Syria, three, Syria three times, but they wouldn't completely destroy their enemies, so they wouldn't have total victory. <clears throat> now, how many times the believers stop short of having total complete victory over their enemies? They stop short. They don't believe for, uh, completely by faith, and Jesus didn't die on the cross so that we would have partial victory. He didn't die on the cross to have partial victory. He died on the cross to have total victory. He didn't die on the cross so that we could have partial salvation. He didn't die on the cross and gave his life, shed his blood, rose from the grave so that we could have, to so that we could have total and complete victory. Victory. That's why he died on the cross. Abundant life, overflowing life, uh, overflow. That's what he wants us to have. Now, why not? Why not? God did it for us. Help us, Lord, to believe, okay? All right, I, I got to quit. I got to quit tonight. But the fact is, many times we stop short of believing God. We believe him for this or that, but we have a hard time believing him for bigger things or to have total victory, okay? If, if we could do it ourselves, we wouldn't have to have faith in God to believe. If we could do it ourselves, we wouldn't have to believe God, right? 
if we can do it ourselves. But if we can't, we can't do it ourselves. I need to trust God. I have to believe God. I have to call upon the name of the Lord, okay? He's a big God. Believe big. Nothing with God is impossible, okay? Amen. All right, hallelujah. All right, so as I come to a close tonight, if we would have faith a grain of a size of mustard seed, mountains would be cast into the sea. The Bible says that. The faith of a size of a grain of a mustard seed, a small seed, a very small seed, tiny seed, okay? So we're talking about the quality of our faith. And so God can save the lost. He can heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, open up blinded eyes, unstop deaf ears, and baptize the Holy Ghost on fire. Do you believe that? Then, then ask God to do it. Don't stop short of God, okay? The only thing stopping God is this. It's you. It's our lack of faith. That's what it is. Man, I tell you what, I... I, I I love it when the church, I love it when you guys come expecting. I love it when you come to a service and you're believing God. Man, I tell you what, I can feel the faith rising in this house. And then there are some days I'm like, do you guys have any faith today? <laughs> because faith comes by hearing here by the Word of God. It takes faith to receive the Word of God. And if you don't have faith in God or faith in the Word of God, it's hard to receive the Word of God. Amen? Because it's got to be received by faith. Amen? And so sometimes I feel like the Word's just bouncing off or it's hitting the ceiling, falling on the floor, whatever. It's not getting to you, Okay? Amen. Let's believe the Lord by faith. Unbelief doesn't receive anything from God. But faith will move mountains. Faith moves mountains. Amen. Faith will move heaven. Faith brings down the giants. Faith brings the walls crashing down. Faith defeats the enemy. Faith calms the raging sea. Faith walks on water. Faith is the key that unlocks all the spiritual blessings that we have from God in heaven. Amen. Amen. Have faith in God. Praise the Lord. Amen. Have faith in God. All right. All right. So we'll talk about Okay, so we're going to talk about the, a little bit more about this next time, Lord willing. And, and then um, I'm finished my study in chapter 13. I'm in chapter 14 now. And, um, and like I said, so we're going to, we're going to, we're going to get into uh, uh, political movements, battles, wars, uh, God raising up nations to chase in Israel and so forth. But it even, involved, even in that, God was still reaching out to his people. Even when they were taken captive, God was reaching, reaching out to his people. I want to say this. A lot of times we as Christians get ourselves in bondage because of the choices we make. Amen. We get ourselves in financial bondage because of the choices Amen. we make. We do. We get ourselves in such poverty-stricken level because of the choices we make. We can't even tithe. You can't tithe. You don't have God's blessing. You have God's cursing, okay? I'm not after your money. I'm after your heart, okay? God has your heart. He takes care of, you take care of the rest. He takes care of the rest, okay? So the fact that's all it is. Uh, um, I, I think that Christians today, a lot of them just stop short. They stop short. And uh, God say, don't, don't hit the arrows just three times on the ground. Hit five or six times. Go ahead. Get all the victory. Believe God. Have total trust in the Lord. Let's believe God for that healing. Let's believe God for, for the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Let's believe God to, to meet that need. Let's believe God to answer that prayer. Let's believe God for that loved one to get saved. Let's believe God for that backslider, slider, the one that's running away from God, the, the Jonah, you know, the one, one that's running from God's presence and running away from God. Let's believe God. God for their soul to be saved. Let's believe the Lord together and see what God does. He's a great God. He's a big God. I pray that your faith is stirred tonight to know that. Amen. Oh, glory. Let's stand. Okay. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Oh, glory. Glory, 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 glory. Hallelujah. God is so wonderful. Praise the Lord. Can we just get a shout, a victory shout tonight unto the Lord and just say, God, hallelujah. The victory is mine through the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe by faith. I'll trust by faith. I'll pray by faith. Worship by faith. Call on God by faith. Serve him by faith. Pray by faith. Believe by faith. Walk by faith. Oh, hallelujah. I believe God for great and mighty things. For he's a big God. He's a big God. So believe for big things and believe for mighty things. Believe for that loved one to come to Christ. Believe for that lost soul to come to Jesus. Believe the Lord. Church, I need your faith. I need your faith to believe for this church. I need your faith to believe for that house. I need your faith to believe for that building over here. I talked to the contractor today. Hallelujah. I need your faith. I need people that will believe God and know that God could part the Red Sea. Bring down the Jericho walls. Bring down the giants. Hallelujah. Part the Jordan River. Oh, to believe the Lord. I need people like yourself that will believe God for the impossible. For he's a miracle working God. Those here, those watching, I need your faith. I need you to believe God. Hey, let's serve God together. Amen. Let's not be like Israel. Let's learn our lesson. Oh, I wish America.
amen, would put the Bible in American history. I wish they would put it in there, world history, and learn what to do and what not to do. If they just study the book, it's right here under their nose. If they would just study, they would learn what to do and what not to do, amen. When you, when you obey God and you, and you live a righteous life by faith before the Lord, then you have his blessing and his favor, and the Lord is with you. He'll protect you. He'll provide for you. God will make a way. He'll bless you. Hallelujah. America once had the blessing of God. She's lost the blessing of God. She's turned away from the Lord. But the church today has turned away from the Lord. Yes. Amen. There's a church on every corner, but there's not a church on every corner. Okay. Believe me when I say this. Oh, God help us. Father, I pray. Lord, in the name of Jesus, stir our faith. Stir our hearts, oh God. Touch my brothers and sisters in Christ. Touch all these children that are coming in. Have your hand upon them. I pray, God, that we'll serve the Lord with all of our heart and we'll not stop short. We'll not beat the arrows on the ground just three times, but we'll go five or six. We'll believe God for total victory. So I pray for that. It's time, church, for total victory. It's time for total victory. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. I want you to receive it right now. Total victory. In the name of Jesus, hallelujah. Praise God. Take it, receive it, grab a hold of it, accept it, believe it now. Total victory in Jesus' name. Total victory. I'm beating the arrows three, five or six times on the, on the ground. Not just three or four. Not just two or three. I, amen. I'm beating them right now by faith five or six times. I'm believing God. This church is believing God for total victory over the enemy of our soul. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Almighty God. We love We praise you. And we just ask this tonight in Jesus' name. And all of God's people that believe said, what? Amen. 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 Well, I tell you what, church, I feel the Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. Man, this is wonderful. God bless you. Hey, listen. Listen, come back. Amen. <laughs> Sunday, all right? And men's Bible study tomorrow night at 630. Guys, bring somebody with you if you can. Praise the Lord. Love you, church. I love and appreciate every one of you. Remember, whatever I say, whatever I'm preaching, whatever I'm teaching, I'm going to preach it in love. Even if it hits us, even if we're convicted, I do this at a motive of love for you, okay? Amen? Praise God. Hallelujah. Jason, good to see you, buddy. Amen. All right, kiddos, come sit down, okay? <laughs> Thank you, honey. Thank you so much. <laughs>